I graduated 2002, and I came and went, and I started working at Jacobson in 2003. So I have a good experience with dishes, 17 years. How does it feel to be competitively employed? I'm good. Good. I get out of my own. One of my biggest fears as a mother is what's going to happen someday when I die and I'm not here to make sure my son is being advocated for. Um, we can't let our society go back to a time where we think isolating people with intellectual disabilities is a good thing. My son has value. My son has gifts and talents and abilities in his way and they need to be supported and they need to be embraced and it's great that places like Sea Park exist and there's wonderful staff that do that but I need the entire community to be able to accept him and understand him so that he can have a full life in the community. One of our self-advocates, Evan, who I think you might have met, um, is, has been really great at growing in his self-advocacy skills and speaking up for himself. And one way that we've facilitated that as an advocate is that we've talked to him and we've talked to him about and asked him questions. What are you concerned about? He specifically wanted to talk to a local representative about employment because that is something close to his heart. So he and I talked about it and um, he told me what his concerns were. I wrote it down for him. And then we had a Zoom meeting with um, Representative Perry Stamball from Perry County. And Evan was able to just speak to the representative and tell him what his concerns were and what he wanted. So that's part of what we do too. Bob's life is an example of how being in the community works, right? It's not just Bob lives in the community now and not an institution. It's, you know, Bob goes and gets his hair cut and his barber knows how he likes it. When he goes into a restaurant, somebody knows how he likes his food cooked. Doesn't that happen to you if you're a regular somewhere? Like somebody's bringing you the way you, the thing you like, the way you like it. You know, that's what real inclusion is. That's what it means. It means I know this individual, I know who they are, I'm familiar with them, I welcome them, and I value them through my actions. When I go in a restaurant with my nonverbal son and a waitress looks at him in the eye and asks him, what would you like, and waits for him to respond with his iPad, that's belonging. That's being connected into his community. He's empowered in that moment to be him, communicate in his way, and self-direct his life. I think the current barriers that people with intellectual disabilities face are still some of the same ones they had before. I worry that since everything changed in one generation, in my generation, from no rights to equal rights, People have taken, beginning to take it for granted. I think families and individuals are, and I'm worried that that could go away. I think something that they need to focus on is continuing the fight. Um, the, the immediate barriers are funding right now. There is just not enough funding in the intellectual disabilities world to provide all the services that are needed. Um, there's only so much money in the pot that the government has to give, but there's so much need. Um, I, I get calls all the time from people who have not been connected to the county, who need um, an immediate emergency residential placement. There, they, there may be a parent has passed away and a sibling cannot provide the services and they need a community home or they need an apartment with, with staffing. It's not easy to get. It doesn't happen like that. It can be years wait. Um, so funding is a major issue. Another barrier for, for having that everyday life that we want for people and what they want um, is, is staff wages, which seems people may not connect that, but staff do so much from personal care for individuals to medication management, to uh, managing behavior, to uh, getting them to doctor appointments, everything you can think of, and yet their wages are typically less than someone makes working at Walmart. Um, that's not okay, and although we have some incredibly wonderful, dedicated staff, we, it's hard to maintain quality staff. What keeps me going is the individuals. That's what makes working here, I, I just I can't find the words, 
that's why I love working for Sea Park, seriously. And that's why I love working with individuals with, um, you know, IDD, um, because they know we care, and they don't act, they don't necessarily have to say thank you. Um, but us seeing that they acknowledge how much we care for them and what we do for them, that right there of wanting us to be a part of, uh, you know, Christmas with you, that meant a lot to everyone who was there that day. The individuals is what keeps me going. They really do. But the one thing we're fighting for is not just, okay, we want you at our church, is we want to miss you if you don't show up on Sunday. That's what needs to happen. And that's not just in churches, that should be at jobs and, you know, at the gym. And, and that's what we want, for people to be so accepted and part of a community, belonging, that they're missed when they're not there. And we're not there yet. I mean, I think some people are. That's developing relationships, though, which, you know, that's the goal. But you have to be out in the community and, and other people have to be open to those relationships. You can't force that. What we're really asking for is the community to open up and say, I have an opportunity for someone with an intellectual disability. So otherwise it's just this uphill battle of us constantly trying to further our mission and keep hitting this barrier. I, I like to write music, play guitar, and listen to Reba McIntyre. What is your favorite Reba McIntyre song? I, any kind, any, any one of them. Tell me about what some of your goals are for the rest of your life. Um, uh, wait for an apartment someday. And uh, after that, I'm going to move to Nashville someday. And work with Reba, say, Reba someday. I'm going to give my mom another grandchild someday. Yeah, what are you what are you passionate about? What do you like to do? Our individuals the process works the same way for our individuals. They have things they like to do, they have goals that they want to accomplish in their lives, but they keep hitting the barrier of stigma which prevents them from achieving those things. So people like Evan want to work in the community and they have goals and aspirations they want to achieve and he is a great example of how local business um, hired him to do a typical job like anyone else. We need more of that in our community. I think today's parents, the new generation, especially parents of young children with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities, needs to understand and know not to take the rights that we have now for granted. Your child will get services once they leave public school. If, there's, if they qualify, if there's funding, and if there's staffing for that program, you might, get, you might get a program. So at a young age, you need to start fighting for the future for your child because once the bus stops coming, there may not be anything. And that's so hard for parents of young children to understand. You need to fight now for that future. So when, I, when we send out blasts that say, hey, we're having issues with funding for, for community homes or for the DSP crisis for pay for staff, the young parents need to fight with us because you're fighting for the future. And we really need, we really need young parents to get involved. That is our dream, that we, we ignite a fire under the young parents for the future. My son has reaped the benefits of the fights that parents and society had before me, right? He can go to public school. We are learning job skills, so hopefully he can gain a competitive job in the community. So our work today has got to be to continue to open up the community for tomorrow's parents. Tomorrow's parents want different things they do not even consider institutionalization. Some of them don't even know that institutions existed, um, which I wa why I think it's an important piece of why we should just remember it, that it was here because it's a place we do not want to go back to. The philosophy is that people with IDD have an everyday life, and that means a life like you have and like I have, and that is the dream, and many people are achieving that, but, but not everyone. So my dream is that 
When someone graduates from high school, they have the choice of services. If they need employment services, they're there. If they need residential services, they're there. Um, if they need just some staffing so they can live in their own apartment, that's an option. That's my dream, that people can make that choice, that they're not told by anyone, either society, you can't do that, or even the regulations coming from the state that's supposed to help them saying, oh no, you have only these choices, you have to do it our way. The dream is that people just make choices and whatever they need to meet those dreams, the funding's there. You're going to meet Reba in August. Yeah. What's one question you're going to ask her? I say that I miss her so much and I love her. Her son just had a birthday yesterday. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I went out to wish him happy birthday. Her birthday's coming up in March. And I'm going to be 60, so 66. I got her shopping for her birthday. Did you? Mm-hmm. What's that? A, a rose. Oh. It's, it's not a real rose, it's like a fake rose. Yeah. And then I let her know I have it for her. It got away to August. Mm -hmm. Yeah.